One of our subscribers asked me, could you do a detailed breakdown of the roundhouse kick and really go into the minutiae in terms of positioning and how to do it right from beginner all the way up to advanced. And he also mentioned about experiencing some tightness but not being really sure where it's coming from or what stretches to do to adjust it. So I'm gonna give you a full breakdown on the roundhouse and we're gonna talk about all the different elements of it. And then I'm also gonna give you a couple of stretch tests to do. And then depending on the results of those tests, some stretching you can start applying to help you improve the kick. Let's get into it. Now I'm gonna assume most people know, but just in case there's anyone out there who doesn't, the roundhouse kick is a kick that comes around the house and kicks with either the instep of the foot or the shin. And that's what we're gonna start with today is what part of the foot should you make connection with? There's always a debate going on as to whether or not you should hit with your instep. So this is the part of your foot, effectively your ankle, where the top part of your foot meets the bottom part of your shin, or should you connect with your shin bone? The arguments for the instep is that it gives you more range and it allows you to be more precise and accurate. The disadvantages, of course, being that you're hitting with a area that has a lot more smaller bones and arguments more nerves so there's a lot more potential for you to get injured whilst throwing the kick. The shin bone although it's a larger area which means that we can do a bit more damage it also means that we don't absorb as much damage ourselves as long as we're hitting the target correctly. If a kick gets checked that's not great for anybody shin on shin is never a good time but if you connect right and hit them with the shin it's almost like swinging a baseball bat at someone's body or someone's head. If there is a disadvantage to kicking with the shin, it is that you'd need to get a little bit closer and you can't be quite as precise. As in, you're not gonna hit one exact spot on the body, leg or chin, but you're gonna hit the whole area with a much larger, harder surface area. The answer to this is kind of style dependent because if you look at things like Taekwondo and Karate, you actually, if you're competing in it, you have to hit with the instep. It needs to hit with the foot. They won't score it with the shin in a lot of disciplines. Now, if you're practicing Muay Thai or you're going into MMA where there's a good chance you're gonna hit without any protection on your shin or on your foot, then it's probably a good idea that you operate more with your shin and less with the instep. That being said, there's plenty of famous examples of knockouts and finishes where people have kicked with their foot as opposed to their shin and don't seem to have done any damage to themselves. Okay, let's get into the actual mechanics of how to throw the kick. And there's really two key areas that we need to pay attention to. One is gonna be our standing foot. So not the leg that we're kicking with, but the leg that's going to stay on the floor and the amount that we pivot that foot, as in how far do we turn it out to allow part two, which is our hips. How far do we rotate our hip over in order to bring the kick in? Now, if you've got an understanding of these two things, the standing foot's pivot and the hip's rotation, this is really the essence of how to throw a good roundhouse kick. Let's start from the ground. So let's start with that foot pivot. A very common beginner mistake is not to pivot the foot at all. So what I mean by that is, imagine you're standing there and your toes are facing in front of you. As you go to kick with one leg, you leave that foot facing forward. Now, mechanically, what this means is you can't rotate either at the knee or at the hip to allow you to turn into the kick. So here, a lot of people complain and think that they have an issue with tightness. They feel like they can't mechanically put their leg in the position they want to, but they're not doing themselves any favors. By turning that foot out, you're naturally allowing your hip to turn over and bring that kick into the bag, the target, the opponent. Now, as with most things, you don't want to go to either extreme. If you overturn that foot, you run the risk of overturning the hips and then throwing yourself off of balance, particularly if the kick is unsuccessful. It's always important to think of techniques, not only if it's going to land, but what happens if it doesn't? What happens if I throw this kick and it hits thin air. How am I gonna end up after the technique? How vulnerable am I gonna be to counter attacks? We need to pivot that foot out. That's what's gonna allow us to turn the hip. I would say, again, if your foot is facing
facing dead straight, think of it at about a 45 degree angle. You're not going all the way 90 degrees, but you want to get it at least 45 degrees. For some people, and I'm one of them, sometimes doing an even wider angle or a bigger turn is going to help, particularly if you do experience some tightness on the inside of your legs or around the hips, the more you turn that foot, the more you're going to be able to rotate the hip over. But an important thing to remember is regardless of how much you turn that foot, you then need to focus your attention on turning over the hip because you can turn that foot out but leave your hip square. We need to make sure that we are pulling the kicking side hip over into the technique. Similar to when you wanna put power into your punches, the way you get power in your punches is that you put your body weight through the technique. You pivot, you rotate your body through the shot. And it's the same deal with kicking. If I just kick with just my leg, I'm not gonna be able to generate an awful lot of power. However, if I turn my hip through, what that is doing is it's putting my body weight in behind the technique. Once again, if I over rotate though, I am gonna leave myself vulnerable to counters or having my leg caught or simply just completely missing and ending up in a really vulnerable position. If I don't turn my hips, we have the same problem as not turning the foot. I'm not gonna actually mechanically be able to execute the technique properly. Let's talk about a few finer details. These are things that again, people go back and forth on. They are not the most important stuff. If you've done those two previous things, you're probably 80% of the way there, but these are things that definitely come up when you're trying to learn it. And one is the arm swing. I did a whole video on this, but I'll break it down quickly here for you as well. The most common critique you'll see when you watch videos on roundhouse kicks is you'll see someone in the comments saying something like, you're dropping your arm when you throw the kick, that's leaving you vulnerable to counter techniques. There is this general belief that your guard should be up here and pinned to you at all times, regardless of all situations. There is no room for that guard to ever drop down. You can see by the way I'm going about this that I'm not a firm believer in that. I do believe there are moments and exceptions where lowering your arm to spread your center of gravity or lower your center of gravity is hugely beneficial, whether it be for head movement and evasion, or in particular for throwing a powerful roundhouse kick. So I've done an example here where I'm kicking and keeping my guard up as best I can. And I've done an example here where I'm allowing myself to swing the same side arm. So if I'm kicking with the right leg, I'm swinging the right arm down and out to the side. Now in both examples, I'm trying to get maximum power, but that raised center of balance by having my hands up by my head and not being able to distribute my weight means that it's far more difficult for me to kick with maximum power and efficiency whilst maintaining a fixed guard position. So personally, I believe that the arm swing is beneficial Again though, this is dependent on your style. If you're fighting, I'll say it again, this karate or taekwondo style, and you're doing more of a lead leg roundhouse kick and you're thinking of it more as a quick peppering technique to score points, you really don't want to leave yourself an opening where people can slip over the top and counter you. However, in a more hard hitting sport such as Muay Thai or in MMA, you want to make sure that you're delivering that kick with maximum power and it's the threat of the power and the having to deal with that kick that effectively makes the defense. It's almost impossible to simply ignore the kick and go into hit where there might be a gap in the guard if the kick is so powerful that if you don't block it, it's going to do significant damage. You've heard the saying, the best defense is usually a good offense. And finally, another kind of grainier detail is how wide out do you swing your leg? And again, I try to picture this from an overview point of view. If the leg goes out as wide as possible to come back round to the target, that means it's traveling a greater distance. It also means that visually for your opponent, they see something coming towards them a lot earlier in the movement, which gives them more time to react. So when you throw your roundhouse kick, although it is going around towards the target, you wanna try to make that angle as small and as tight as possible. Possible. So don't swing your leg out as wide as you can. Again, imagine that baseball bat swinging around from the side. You want to kind of come in as tight and close from your body as you can. Think more like a samurai sword coming out and slicing up and through to the target. 
the tighter we can make that rotation angle, the less we telegraph the kick to our opponents and the less chance they have of being able to defend it. So a quick summary on the technique for the roundhouse kick. Generally speaking, you need to pivot out your standing leg. You need to rotate your hip over in order to throw the kick. In terms of what part of your leg you're gonna make impact with, again, dependent on your style, the instep will give you more range and more precision but it's got more vulnerability, which means it's unlikely to generate the same amount of just blunt force trauma. The shin, a lot more dangerous in terms of its ability to make a large impact and a lot less risky to you because it's just one or two big bones as opposed to all the little bones in your feet. However, you're not gonna get the same range or precision that you can with that instep. You can choose whether or not to swing your arm when you throw the kick, but in my experience, the arm swing allows you to develop the kick with a lot more power and a lot more force. However, depending on your style, there might be a situation where maintaining the guard whilst kicking will be beneficial to you. And finally, try to swing that leg with as tight an angle round as possible, rather than going out wide and telegraphing that kick to your opponent. Okay, but here's the catch. You can know all of this stuff, but if you've got real physical tightness in your body, you might struggle to execute on a lot of this. So what I'm gonna give you now is free stretch tests that you can do. Now note, these are the tests. You don't need to do these stretches to improve them, but these are a way of checking if you've got flexibility issues in certain areas of your legs. The first one is just a toe touch. So stand with your feet either touching together or shoulder width apart. Stretch up high to start with, and then bend at the waist and see how far down you can go. What you're aiming for is a minimum of being able to touch your fingertips to the floor whilst keeping your legs straight. Now, if you can't do this, as in your hands are still off the floor while you're doing it, it probably means that you have very tight hamstrings and that's gonna limit your ability to throw the roundhouse kick. Now, the fix for this is to do hamstring focused stretching. I wouldn't necessarily recommend bending over to touch your toes as a stretch because it can put a lot of strain on your back. So a great way to adjust for this is do a single leg at a time, put one foot in front of the other, raise it up onto the heel and stretch into that leg. This is gonna get the stretch onto your hamstring a lot earlier and put a lot less stress on your back. The second common area of tightness is gonna be on the inside of your leg and your groin muscles. So these stretches, we're gonna work a box split to test it. What I mean by this is we're gonna take our legs as wide as we can and keeping them dead straight. And again, the objective now is, can we get the palms of our hands to touch the floor? So can we get our legs wide enough that we can get the palms of our hand to touch the floor and ideally on the same line as our feet? So if my feet are on one line, my hands should be in the middle based upon that same line. So not way out in front with my hands. Again, if you find that you can't get wide enough to do this, you've probably got tightness on the inside of that leg. This will also include the hamstring, but that inner leg and the groin. The stretches that you can work for this, my favorite one to help with this directly is what's called a sumo squat. So I'll take my legs super wide and then I will squat down in that position, place my arms on the inside of my thighs and use them to push my legs out, thus focusing that stretch on that inner leg. And the more I can sit in this stretch, so the lower I can get my butt, the more of a groin stretch that I'm gonna get in there as well. Finally, you probably will find that you might have some tightness in your hips. And for some of you, if you've got extreme tightness, you might find that you've got it in your ankles. So this single one-sided squat where we extend one leg out and we squat down onto one side, this is the way to test that. If you can get your butt relatively close to the floor whilst maintaining a flat foot, that probably means you're okay. But if you find that you have to lift your heel off the ground or you can't get anywhere close to the ground with your bum in terms of how close I'm getting to in this example here, then you certainly wanna start working on your deep squat. So take the straight leg out of the equation, bring both legs in and practice your ability to go deep into a squat. Now, a great way to do this is supported. I didn't do an example of this, but imagine having a bar in front of you, a low bar or something to hold on to that you can practice getting down into this position and staying there for an extended period of time. 
Like anything, there's no quick fix and stretching is one of those things that if you wanna see the benefits of it, do it regularly, do it often and do it for small amounts. You don't need to stretch for hours every single day. Try to do 10 to 15 minutes every day without skipping and you'll find that within the course of a month, two months, you are gonna see a big improvement, but you do need to stretch really regularly. Maybe a day off here and there to let the muscles rest and recover, but generally speaking, stretch every day, stretch a little bit every single day. So there we have it guys. I hope that's helped you with some of your questions around the roundhouse kick. I tailored this one towards kicking with your back leg, but a lot of this will apply to kicking with your lead leg as well. If you have any questions, drop them down in the comments. Let me know what you'd like to see next and I will see you on the next one.